So how about we go make a cuff for my horn? I'll see you back at the studio. Hello everyone, my name is Daniel Reitz. This is the Leatherverse. Today we got something a little different for you. As you saw in the intro, my family and I, we really enjoy going to the Renaissance festivals. In fact, it's one of our favorite things to do. And while I'm there, I will typically carry this drinking horn with me. I picked it up at last year's Scarborough Renaissance Festival in Texas, and I love it but it needs something a little extra, right? It needs some embellishment. So I decided that we'd put a cuff on the top of it. So that's what we're gonna do today. So how do we decide what design to put on the cuff? Well, Black Raven Armory has some amazing Viking-inspired kind of Celtic knot serpent-looking kind of designs, and I absolutely love them. That's what we're gonna be using today. I will put a link in the description. That way, if you decide you wanna make some version of this, you can follow along with us. This cuff would be perfect for a wrist cuff, a koozie, a Yeti wrap. There's all kinds of different ways that you could use this, and I'll put a link in the description so that you can follow along. So a couple of things really quick before we jump into the actual project. Number one, you're gonna notice that the cuff isn't straight, it's, it's crooked around the borders of it. And the reason for that is this horn being a natural product, it's not perfectly round, it's not perfectly level. So the cuff is made to fit this specific horn and it actually took a little while to dial it in and get it right. So that's why it's not straight. The other thing that I wanted to point out is that we're gonna be using the tablet in the videos going forward. Now, if you watch any of my videos on, on Weaver Leather Supply, you'll, you'll have already seen this. Um, we've gotten a lot of positive feedback saying it makes understanding the concepts and the, the how and the why of it all a lot easier. So we're gonna be incorporating the tablet into these videos as well going forward when it makes sense. I think with that, we're ready to jump in. So we've already got all the prep steps done. That's stuff like taping the back, transferring it, casing, all of that kind of thing. That's already done. So the first step is gonna be cutting it in with the swivel knife. Now, as I do this, you're probably gonna notice that I'm switching back and forth between my Barry King traditional blade and my Dwayne Watts blade. Now, the thing that makes this special, watch, I'm the, the barrel of it's not moving, but I can turn the blade itself. That makes the really tight turns in this design so much easier. Now, don't get me wrong. I could do it with the Barry King traditional blade. I'm sure you could too. But this blade, because it turns the way it does, makes those tight turns so much easier. And I did a review. It's not really a review. It's more of a which one's right for you kind of video. Uh, if you're interested in that, I will put a card at the end of this video so that you can jump straight to it and kind of decide if one of these is right for you. So let's go ahead and jump in. I've already done all of my prep steps. Then we can start working through the different uh, aspects of the design and cutting it in. As we're doing that, there's a couple of things that you wanna keep in mind. Number one is that we wanna cut roughly a third of the way through the leather. Now, if you're working with super thin leather, like one, two ounce, that's just not gonna be possible. What I'm working with here is about a four to five ounce leather. So, you know, a third of the way through the leather is perfect. The other thing that you wanna keep in mind is that we don't want to connect the cut. Anytime you have two cuts that come up together, we don't want those to, to overlap. We don't want them to connect. And the reason for that is uh, over time, those connection points can let, allow the leather to lift and it really doesn't wear as well. So you wanna leave a little bit of a gap between the cuts. We'll connect them later with our bevel. So as you're watching me cut in the tooling window, something I wanna point out to you is that I'm not using my hand and my wrist for the movement. All of the movement is coming from my elbow and my shoulder. As I pull that blade along, you're not seeing my hand or my wrist move. It's all coming from my elbow and my shoulder. If you try to use your hand and your wrist, it's gonna get real choppy real fast. By using your entire arm, that's gonna give you the best shot at pulling a straight line. So one of the things I forgot to record was how I put the tooling window around the design. It's very simple to do. All you have to do, take your wing dividers. I typically will set this at a quarter inch. You can set it whatever makes sense for your project. And then I'm gonna drop one tine off the side of the leather and I'm lightly gonna scribe in a line. I wanna hold it more or less flat. That way I'm, I'm just barely marking the leather. The higher you go, the, high, the more of a scratch you're gonna put on the leather. And that's not really what we're going for. We're just trying to put a guide in there so that we have something to follow with our swivel knife. All right, so now it's time to start beveling and I'm gonna be using a steep bevel from Weaver Leather Supply. There's three different types of bevels that you can get. There's traditional, which most of us have used. 
There's the steep, which is a little bit more of a sharp angle, and then there's extra steep. Extra steep really just creates a line. The steep is kind of the best of both worlds. You get a well-defined edge and you get a little bit of shadow. So that's what we're gonna be using to do the, the design today, at least most of the beveling. Now that we've got that done, the outside of the design is beveled, now it's time to go in and add some texture. And really what I'm gonna be doing is I'm gonna start with my largest of my three texture tools, and I'm gonna go in and I'm just gonna work anywhere that that tool would fit. Now, if my tool doesn't fit here, I'm not gonna work it in right there. I'm gonna work anywhere that I can get that, that tool naturally without having to force it. Once I cover the areas where it will naturally fit, then I'm gonna go back, I'm gonna drop down to the medium and then down to the small, and then I'm gonna start working in those really tight areas. So I want to show you an area that's pretty frequently overlooked when adding texture to the background, and that's going to be the beveled areas right up against the design. So I'm going to put kind of a dotted, uh, I'm going to put some dots on top of the area that I'm talking about so you can still see what I'm talking about. But if you look right through here, you can see kind of that white halo that goes all the way around it. Well, that's because of the bevel. So as we're going through, after we've gone in with the larger bevel, we want to go back and take our medium and small bevel and really snug up, up against the design to make sure that we get that texture all the way up against our design. We want to do the same thing as we go around the border uh, and make sure we take that texture all the way up to that tooling window. So the next step is optional, but really it's the reason that my work has such crisp detail, especially around the edges. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take my extra steep bevel and I'm gonna go back in, let's jump back over to the tablet here, and I'm gonna work back in anywhere where the texture touches the tooling window or it touches the design. So that would be right through here. So on, along the outside, maybe on the inside here where we put some texture on the inside any of those areas where the background texture touches the design or the tooling window, I wanna take my extra steep bevel and go back in there and really crisp up those lines. Now this shouldn't affect your backgrounding that you just got finished doing because we're using the extra steep and really it just drives straight down and creates a line. 
So why do we even need to go back and redo the beveling? Well, first, we're not redoing the beveling. What we're doing is we're taking an extra steep bevel and we're going back and we're really crisping up those lines. The reason we need to do that is because adding background and uh, texture to the background can really mute the definition that we spent time putting in. So going back and really quickly redoing, recrisping, redefining those edges really will make a big difference in your end result. So now it's time to jump inside the design. We're gonna work on all that detail that gives it the character that it's got, but I wanna show you something that I call shadow flow. You're not gonna hear that term anywhere else. It's just a term I made up in my head, but it can really affect the way your viewer, the, the person looking at your project sees it. And it's called shadow flow. Uh, just the angle of shadows is all it is. So if we look at the tablet here, what I want you to see is that his head and his body are flowing this way right so this comes around that way this goes that way so what we want to do is we want to make the shadows flow the same direction well how do we do that think of it like water running downhill now i'm going to zoom in here real quick it's going to get a little fuzzy i apologize for that but it'll give you a better idea of what we're doing so as i zoom in if the water is flowing downhill this way we want those shadows to be on the downhill side of the line right so they want to be there like that. What we don't want is for them to be on the top side of the line. And what that means is when you go in with your bevel, the straight up and down side needs to be, let me back this out, you want the shadow of your bevel on the downhill side. And you want to make sure you maintain that all the way through the design. So think about it as you go through. Your shadows should go this way. When they hit here, they're gonna come around that way. This one's gonna go that direction. Like that. That's the flow that you wanna maintain. Make sure you don't change angles with your shadows. You can use any of the three bevels to do the line work that we're working on right now. You can use a traditional steep or extra steep. For me, I wanted a really crisp, narrow line, so I used the extra steep, but really you can use any three of them. It just depends on how wide you want that shadow. So now we're gonna go through and work some more of the lines in the interior of the design. And I'm gonna start and just work my way around the spirals. Make sure you don't cross these little bars that are here. We don't wanna do that. So I'm just gonna work my way through, gonna work around, skip the bar, come back. And as I'm going through, I'm gonna pick these up. As it presents itself and it's easy to hit, I'm gonna go ahead and grab those while I'm here. Once you're done with that, now we can go back and we can start picking up these bars that run down through the center of his body. Steep, traditional, either one will work, just depends on what kind of look that you're going for. Traditional is gonna give you more of a shadow. So now we're gonna work on those circles right at the top of his head, kind of on that horn. And the easiest way to do this is just to use the same cedars that you use on your flowers in your floral work. Uh, the thing I would point out here is that these are three different sizes. That's gonna be the easiest way to do this. But if you don't have three sizes, then it's not a real big deal. Just use what you've got on hand. And it doesn't have to be the cedar that has the smooth sides. Maybe you've got one that's got a starburst pattern, starburst pattern on the outside of it or something like that. Anything you've got will work. The cedars are best because it gives you that perfectly round circle.
Now I'm gonna go in and work the eye. I'm just using a simple round bevel. It's smooth, doesn't have any texture on the bottom of it at all. I think this is the medium one here. I'll put a link in the description below. But because it's round, it's the perfect size. It drops right down into that eye and you can just work it in a circle. If you don't have a round beveler, you can definitely use a more traditional like square bevel. Just use one of the smaller ones so it fits in there easily. Um, and it'll take a little bit more time, but you can definitely do it with a traditional bevel. So let's talk about why you might wanna use one bevel versus another. It all comes down to shadow versus definition. So as we're working that swivel cut, how much definition do we want on one side and how much shadow do we want on the other? Traditional bevel is gonna give you the widest shadow with the least amount of definition along that swivel cut. The steep bevel is gonna be kind of the best of both worlds. It's gonna give you more definition on the, on the swivel cut and it's gonna give you some shadow, but not as much as the traditional bevel. And extra steep is gonna be virtually all definition. There's very little shadow, shadow to it whatsoever. It's gonna give you a super crisp edge along the swivel cut that you're working and virtually no shadow at all. So the next step's optional. It's not one you have to do, but you're gonna find a lot of the more advanced crafters doing this. And it's simply taking a modeling spoon and rounding the edges of your work. Now, not all edges need to be rounded off. So what you're looking for is any edge that would naturally have a rounded edge to it. So what, what are some good examples of that? Well, the serpent that we're working on here, he wouldn't have a really crisp corner. He'd have a more rounded beveled edge to it vine work in your floral work, those are all great examples of something that naturally would be rounded off. And that's a great area to use this technique. Super simple to do. All we're doing is taking the modeling spoon, run it along that corner, kind of knocking that edge down and giving it a nice smooth bevel. So off camera, I went ahead and dyed the project black. My wife's got birds in the house, their respiratory system is very sensitive. So I try not to do anything like that in the house. So I can't take my whole camera set up out there. So I went ahead and dyed it off camera, super simple to do. All you're doing is taking a sponge and applying the dye to the project, letting it dry. Now that we've got that done, I'm gonna go back and I, I really wanted some flash to it. If you look at the horn, the top of it up here is gold. So I thought that would make a lot of sense to to paint the serpent and the border of the cuff with gold. So that's what we're gonna do now. So I found with the metallic paints from Angelus, you really have to put multiple coats on. They go on kind of thin. You can see the background behind them. So just be patient, two, three coats, you're usually good to go. So after the paint dried, I took it outside and gave it a good eight to 10 coats of leather sheen. This stuff works fantastic for locking paint down onto the leather. Then you can go back in and antique over the top of it. The reason I use leather sheen or an aerosol instead of something like tan coat, which I love, is because there's no contact associated with the, the aerosol, which means there's no chance of that sealer lifting the paint off your project. So after those eight to 10 coats of leather sheen have dried, it shouldn't take very long at all. Then you can bring it back in the house and we can antique it. This is a really simple process. It looks a little scary, but I'm gonna be using Phoebing's Black Paste Antique. And all you have to do here, I use a sponge, smear it on the project really liberally. I'm wearing gloves because it will stain your hands and not terribly, but it will. And then let it sit for 10 to 15 minutes. Then I'm gonna go back in with a paper towel that I folded really flat and I'm gonna buff the surface of the project. The reason I like a paper towel is because a lot of different fabrics have a nap to them, those little fibers that stick out and those can lift the antique out of the low spots in the project. And I really want it to stay there to one degree or another. So I like a paper towel. Once I've got the majority of it off, I just keep buffing it each time with a brand new paper towel 
folded really flat until I get the majority of the residue off the top of it. Then I'm gonna let it sit for about another half hour, maybe 45 minutes for that antique to really lock in place. Once you can touch it and not get any residue on your hand from those low spots, then you can go back in with tan coat and put a really light coat on top of the project. And what this is gonna do is gonna brighten it up for you, kind of take that, that muddy residue that it might have, it's gonna lift that right off for you. So I don't know about you, but I'm pretty happy with it so far. I think it's turning out pretty cool. Uh, it fits with my drinking horn. It's got the gold that matches. It ties in really well, but I want a little bit of shine in there, a little bit of bling. So I've got some very small jewel rivets, I think is what you would call them. I'll put a link in the description uh, below if I can find them so that you can get some as well. But I wanted a little bit of shine in there. So what I did is I went in, I punched a, a hole for a rivet right through the eye that we beveled earlier and dropped a rivet down in there, at least one of the jeweled rivets. Now I checked red, I checked blue, none of them worked. I really like just a simple white diamond look. So that's what I went with. So something I want to point out here is I've got the red chopping block under my project to set the rivet on, but that's going to be way too firm. So what I did is I put a piece of leather up under there, three ounce, four ounce, something like that, just enough to pad it a little bit, and I use that to set the rivet. That way I'm not at any risk of cracking that jewel that's in there. So now we need some way to secure the cuff to the drinking horn. Now, I could have gone with something, you know, like Sam Brown buttons or snaps or something like that, but I wanted it to have that ye olde kind of medieval look to it. So I'm gonna go with grommets. I know they didn't have grommets back then, but I'm gonna go with grommets and that'll allow me to lace it up, which will kind of give me that old look that I'm going for. So this is pretty simple to do. All you really need is the setter that matches the grommets that you're using. And I'll put a link to the one that I used in the description below, but setting it up is pretty simple to do. All I'm gonna do is grab my wing dividers and set them to a half inch. That works for my project. You need to make sure it works for your project. Then I'm gonna lightly scribe a line down each side. For mine, three grommets gonna work really well. So I'm gonna put one at the top, one at the bottom, and one in the middle. Now I wanna point out before I punch the holes, I laid the grommets on there to make sure that they would sit the way I want them to. Since they do, I'm good to go to go ahead and punch the holes. Now, I could have gone with gold or brass or something like that, but I really didn't want the grommets to be a feature in the design. I wanted them to kind of hide, which is why I went with the gunmetal ones that you see here. So lacing it up and we're done. I absolutely love this thing. As you saw, I've already gotten to use it at the Ren Fest, got lots of comments on it. I felt like a Viking drinking out of this thing. That's gonna do it for this video. I will see you in the next one. And in the meantime, go make something amazing. I wonder if I can drink coffee out of this thing.